Yes. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dabin Chu. I'm director of CAPE. Welcome to this month's CAPE Advanced Technology Lecture Series. Today, we are very honored to have uh, Valerie Majoran join us to give uh, a lecture. Before he start, I would like to introduce him because he has a very interesting background. Valerie started working in a range of automotive related roles since he first studied in 2001, before he joined the Jaguar Land Rover in 2015. After finishing his university degree in automotive engineering, he continued working for a Dutch car magazine, where he started as the intern before and where he was trained to be lead technical testing, a role where he would test various parts and feed information around its function. Back to the journalist who write about the technology part. After testing hundreds of vehicles, he got more and more interested in the design of the vehicle while taking the human fact in mind. He wondered why there were cars with glare on the instrument panels, blocking vision, or why some vehicles were much more intuitive to control than others. Intrigued by this source, he quit his job and started another study at the at Hoven University of Technology, the Netherlands, on the research master human technology interaction and the focus on the combination of technology and the human cognition science to make it more intuitive and safer. Combined his study. Can you hear me? Yes. Ah. Combined his study with various research roles around human technology interaction, the automotive and the mobility history. This experience have given him many insights in how important it is to design technology around the human. In Jerry Land Rover, he was working on a range of human machine research projects before fully focusing on align future head-up display technology with human-centered design principles. He considers the collaboration with CAPE that he joined in 2015 as one of his key personal motivators to keep pushing the merging of technology and human science for better and safer system as a solution they worked on providing insight on how to tackle the key challenges. His research interests include vision perception, augmented reality, and effect on human visual perception, trust and acceptance of technology and immersive technologies. So today, his title of lecture is designing augmented reality head-up display from a human Valerie, please. Thank you, Dapping. Um, let me share my screen. Just a second. This is a slightly different interface I'm used to. Um, I hope you can see yeah. my screen. We can see your screen. Presentation mode. Yeah. Um, so, yes. Uh, thank you for me here. I'm very honored. I'm also very proud to uh, some passionate about that I'm researched since 2015, um, predominantly on, on head of display. Um, a very long-term project with uh, 
uh, Dapping and his colleagues, uh, of which some are uh, in this call actually. So guys, thank you for joining as well. Um, and yeah, I have quite a few slides. I have some interesting things to say, I think, I hope. Uh, so let's just start. Um, so what are we going to talk about? Um, we're going to talk about designing an augmented reality headed display from a human factor perspective. Um, but based on, on the things I've experienced in my career, I, I also think it's very interesting to look at a little bit of history and structure that has already been formed that can kind of guide us to understand why we're doing things and also to see that uh, in history there's always something uh, around repeating patterns. Um, I'll go a little bit into the evolution uh, and the need for driver, uh, mostly visual information communication and in-vehicle displays. Uh, then I'll briefly talk about the head of display and how it works, uh, augmented reality and, and why we are uh, working on it, <clears throat> as well as several uh, other competitors. Um, and then I go a little bit more in detail about how the human factors needs and requirements influence uh, the development of these systems, uh, because it essentially should go hand in hand. So we are the ones that use that technology, so therefore uh, it needs to align to our needs and requirements both on an unconscious uh, as well as a conscious level and then in the end i have some conclusions and, and maybe there's a little bit of a discussion around that um, and, and obviously I'm, I'm very happy to receive questions uh, but also feedback so as a start um, a little bit about the evolution of automotive technology um, i've worked for a mobility history professor uh, who wrote a book about um, the evolution of automotive technology and he uh, distinguished five phases uh, around the evolution of automotive technology. And if we look at the first one, the emergence, it's really around the pioneering phase, um, variation in propulsion types and lock-in of universal automobile configuration. So that was really a time when the automobile was... Uh, or started to develop, started to form uh, into something that we know now is a vehicle. Uh, but at that time, you had uh, cars with three wheels, four wheels, uh, five, six, uh, you name it. We've had various different propulsion types. Um, believe it or not, but the actual competition around that time in terms of um, com uh, propulsion was around steam vehicles, uh, electric vehicles, and internal combustion uh, engine vehicles. Um, and what you see mostly around that time are very experimental but also heavy and large family cars. Uh, after the uh, first one on the components, much changes that locked in. So um, four wheels had a steering wheel, a bottle and a brake pedal, lights, a roof, uh, these sort of things that are normal. But at that time, it was something that the vehicle was kind of evolving into. And you see uh, the start of the smaller car. Uh, the exuberance phase, which were pretty much the heydays of uh, mass motorization, at the Western even uh, and an affordable family car uh, started to arise there, the Volkswagen Beetle, um, the Golf as well, and maybe the Toyota Corolla uh, was, was uh, just introduced, I believe. And then there was a period of doom, um, energy and pollution consciousness uh, in a phase of global motorization. And we see the first um, yeah, ideas or, or execution of a personalization in combination with the electronification of the car. So electric windows, uh, but also electronic fuel injection. <clears throat> and a lot of things in the car were uh, automated by, by using uh, electronification. And then there's a confusion area or era. Um, and th this book is from 2014, so I don't know uh, when, when this will end. Um, but it's mostly around climate change, uh, brick motorization. Brick stands for Brazil, Russia, India, and China. 
uh, a lot more modern vehicles um, have, have uh, been introduced and the revival of, of railways, metro, uh, polarization, um, also smart mobility is something that we, we see a lot these days and um, despite this book is not that old, but I think we could uh, add the word intelligent in there as well. Intelligent smart mobility, mobility that thinks with us and should suggests us um, uh, new new changes and, and adaptations. And a paradigm change to electric vehicles. And I think we can all see that now that there is definitely a big boost uh, um, towards electric vehicles. Uh, your Land Rover will start building or selling um, electric vehicles only from uh, 2025 and, and a lot more complex kind of an illustration of, of uh, these different periods and, and uh, what sort of vehicles you had there. On the left we can see that the Benz Patent Motorwagen, um, still a vehicle, three wheels. Uh, it didn't have a steering wheel, it had kind of a, a lever with a handle on it. Um, and in the middle, we see an uh, electric vehicle, uh, one of the first, if not the first uh, electric vehicle, that is the Loner Porsche. Uh, and you see a lot more, uh, you see that develop a lot more into a vehicle as we know it today, a steering wheel. Uh, there are some lights at the front, uh, at the sides as well, uh, fenders, uh, brakes. Um, and in this case, electronic um, or the electric motors were in, in the wheels. And then um, around the uh, persistence era, there is uh, what we know as, as a much more matured vehicle. Um, and in this case, it's, it's a Jaguar SS uh, saloon with a roof uh, a lot more mature than the previous vehicles and, and that further developed in, in what we know as, uh, as the car today. Um, at that time, trends were also quite different um, from this article from Automotive Industries uh, 1929. We see that the trends are very much around um, mechanical technology. So horsepower was increasing. Uh, steering gears, there were different variants of steering gears. In general, there were many variants of, of uh, technologies that could be used in a vehicle. So it was still that phase of trying to figure out what works best and, and uh, what would evolve. Um, but then we go into <clears throat> the more, uh, let's say, uh, information communication um, topic. So what I'm showing here is a picture of the Brook Swan car. It's um, actually commissioned, I think, by a Scotsman. It was built in the UK and then it was brought to India. Uh, and uh, an Indian Maharaja drove around in it. Um, it was taken off the road quite quickly because that swan head uh, would scare the elephants, uh, which I think is, is, is quite a funny story. But what's inside is, for this topic, for this presentation, even more interesting um, because it had a telegraph. and around 1910, you wouldn't expect it, but there was already a, a need uh, and a solution to instruct the driver to go somewhere, to perform actions while driving, uh, drive home, as you can see on the left. So that the telegraph for the owner's unit is uh, has a lever and it, he could indicate uh, where to turn left or go faster or stop even. And then the driver would, uh, would see that message and, and would act accordingly. It was also the case that at that time, drivers were not allowed to communicate with passengers. So um, there had to be found uh, a solution uh, for this problem to still instru instruct a driver. But I think it... um, we can also see other ways of communicating. There was a microphone for communicating with the driver. This picture I took in a museum was uh, from, from uh, or that, that device is from 1905. And there's a scrolling roadmap uh, from around 1930 uh, made in England, where you could scroll uh, the map up and down for, for navigation. So also there around the 30s, there's definitely a need for information uh, communication. Um, 
when we look at the 60s, we see that uh, a small television uh, was used to put in cars. In this case, it's uh, difficult to read, but this television was used uh, for in taxis, so taxi passengers could watch television. Um, but I see this as uh, uh, an interesting start of bigger displays in the vehicle. Obviously, we were monitoring speed, um, engine revolutions on, on the cluster, kind of the, the instruments you see in front of you, in front of the steering wheel. But the introduction of a television in the car, uh, even though it's on a more custom basis, it does highlight that the human does want to add something like this in, in the vehicle. Um, and we see this starting from the 60s going all the way up to now. So on the fictional aspect, uh, the James Bond car had a display in the middle. Uh, it showed a navigation, I believe. Uh, but also on uh, the concept car level, the vision level, because that's what you do with concept cars. You, you show a vision that you want to work towards to from the 80s. Uh, the Citroën had a screen uh, in front of the steering wheel. And also interesting, the Buick Reata um, had a screen in the vehicle. And this was actually the first introduction of a touchscreen uh, in the vehicle. And we see many more variations uh, of this in, in the Ital design car, uh, where there's a, an even bigger television, uh, but also in terms of custom cars. So in the middle, uh, bottom middle, you see uh, a layout that uh, shows a lot of instrument gauges and, and a center screen, because obviously that, that person had a need to, to see lots of information, maybe too much in, in the car. Um, but again, a screen. And fast forward a bit to 2005, um, early 2000s, and it was definitely it was definitely accepted that this screen uh, was going to be in the cars for a while. And it would show things like navigation, it would show media and information. So there was a massive piece between <clears throat> the near future um, concept cars and, and on the road. But, but there's apparently a need to, to put this uh, amount or, or area of, of display information in the car. Um, but we do have to understand if it's the right thing to do, or is it just because we're pushing technology? And yeah, based on, on that previous example of concept cars, you might think, well, maybe it will take a while before this will be uh, kind of the standard in a car, but actually next year, uh, Mercedes is introducing, um, in this case, three different screens. It all looks um, a little bit more like it's one integrated panel. Uh, that's the intention. And um, the driver or the passenger has also been taken into account now. So in the middle, you see some driver information uh, or vehicle information uh, for the driver. Uh, in the cluster behind the steering wheel, you see uh, I'm not really sure what they're showing there, but it's also related to, to the driving environment. And on top of that, you can just see it. There's a, a head up display, uh, a quite a large one. Uh, it is it's introducing this year with a very large field of view. That's the area, the size of, of and uh, that, that will have augmented reality. So we're then becoming bigger there as well. Um, but you might think, well, that is a lot of information that you can show and, and you're entirely correct. Um, there's a lot of information that can be shown and is shown uh, at the moment. Um, and several examples are our navigation. 
uh, advanced driver assistance systems. Uh, with that, I mean, uh, features like forward alerts, uh, when it alerts when you approach something too fast or, or it could be a, a hazard, an imminent threat. Uh, lane keeping assistance, uh, features like that, uh, adaptive cruise control. Uh, then there's information about the vehicle state. Uh, you can see your tire pressure, for example. Uh, you can put the car into different uh, modes, so uh, a track mode, off-road, uh, an eco mode, and you would all see um, your, your information change or adapt to those modes on, on the displays. In terms of infotainment, there has been a massive increase over the past years. Um, definitely media, so radio was something we all knew, uh, CDs, uh, MP3s in the car, uh, but we can also listen to online music services <clears throat> next to the music that, that you own, uh, own on your phone, for example. Uh, there's an increase in comfort features, uh, massage programs, other wellness features where you can choose a theme and the theme will try to put you in a certain mood in, in the vehicle, uh, which can include even uh, a scent that's been uh, uh, put into car into the car, a spray, uh, and, and that will have its information to show to the driver as well. Uh, there is more advanced mobile phone integration. Um, you can now um, use the navigation apps on your phone for in the vehicle. They can be integrated in, in some uh, vehicle models. Uh, and there is an increase in intelligent features, and, and they also need to understand what your desires are, what you turn on or off, uh, what you want to let them know. Uh, so these are things you can interact with uh, as well in the vehicle. Um, but next to that, there's also traffic rules. Obviously, in the beginning, uh, the emergence period, there, was, there were hardly any uh, traffic rules and at some point we started to put those in we started to put um, in the environment traffic signs um, but we also digitized some of them and even a step further we can also show uh, traffic rules in the vehicle traffic sign recognition for example um, through your navigation you also see uh, traffic rules roads that you can't turn into uh, roads where you have to be careful or adapt your speed or there's uh, an average speed check zone. Those are all types of information that can now be provided into the car. So we have a much more intelligent uh, communication with the car. And next to that, we also have increased traffic. So uh, there are a lot more car owners these days. It's a lot busier and taking all of the into account there's a huge amount of information that we process during driving um, if we look at the one of the main topics of, of this presentation the head of display uh, it actually has been around for a while too um, i always thought that the 1988 automobile was the first one to to implement a head of display uh, in a more conceptual form, uh, experimental form. It was actually uh, introduced in a vehicle in a short vet was sold. It was more limited edition. And then a year later, Nissan came uh, with a more mass produced vehicle. And uh, in one of our brands, Range Rover, we also have a health display. Uh, and we started selling these or implementing these in a vehicle since 2013. Now, what is a head of display? Um, and I'm going to explain you what a head of display is, but a more conventional head of display. So that's the type of system that we use today. Um, it comprises of a, a light source. Uh, let me find my laser pointer. Um, so there's a light source with a display and that combination we call a picture generation unit. This is where the image is formed. Um, it beams onto a folding mirror, uh, which enlarges the image uh, and then uh, goes on to a rotable mirror that can also be adjusted to adjust to the height of the driver. So we have to take into account uh, a large 
a variety, a large range of, of drivers uh, in terms of heights, for example. So a very short drivers should be able to see the head of display image and very large or very tall uh, drivers should also be able to see uh, the head of display image as the average person does. So um, that image uh, that uh, is projected onto the rotable mirror uh, goes through the glare trap or the light trap uh, onto the windscreen, uh, it's reflected and then uh, into the eye. And depending on the optical path, there is a projection distance um, <clears throat> where the virtual image is uh, is projected. And uh, currently in, in our cars, that's around two, two and a half meters. So at the edge of the bonnet uh, is where you see that image. Um, and it's a 2D image. So there are some challenges with this uh, sort of setup, with this sort of head of display. Uh, it has a limited field of view because when you want to enlarge the image, you also need to enlarge the mirrors and therefore you enlarge the packaging volume. Um, packaging volume is one of the biggest, if not the biggest uh, challenge for head of display, especially augmented reality head of display in the car because there's simply no space. Um, you really have to design the car around the head of display in order to, for example, show a really, really big image on the windscreen. And um, yeah, this is something that is, uh, uh, yeah, as I said before, a massive challenge. It's also um, one of the challenges also is to make sure that everybody who works on the car uh, we're talking about the windscreen, we're talking about the packaging teams, we're talking about the head of display teams, is that they are all um, aware of why these changes need to happen. And um, yeah, with the introduction of head of display and, and when you see that augmented reality is, is developing really quickly, then we need to adapt really quickly as well. But for example, with packaging, uh, creating the structure of the car, that's something you do at a very early stage. And yeah, if, if uh, some, some innovative technology comes up, we, we do have to understand how that will impact, impact the vehicle and, and act on time and act accordingly for this. Um, so next to that, there are also uh, cooling issues, for example. So sunlight can enter that, that light trap, that glare trap. And in, in this case, with conventional head of display, um, the temperature can increase because there's uh, a mirror magnification. Uh, so that unit also has to be designed for very high temperatures. Um, just taking a quick look at the uh, windscreen. So when we use a head up display, uh, we also need a film in, in the windscreen because if we just project uh, an image onto the windscreen, then uh, without a film, then we get a ghost image, as you can see on, on the left image. So it looks quite distorted. It is because there are two images that, that are being sent uh, into the eye and it's just not sharp enough. It's more annoying than it is helpful. Um, so in the windscreen, there needs to be a, a wedge layer, um, a film that can delete that that uh, ghost image. And um, I believe in, in CAPE, uh, some very clever people have developed uh, uh, some interesting solutions around this. Um, so bearing in mind, if you want to sell a head of display, you have to take all costs into account. So the head of display unit itself has a cost, but also adding a layer into the windscreen has a cost. Um, so there's definitely room for cost optimization along the whole trajectory um, next to the, the benefits for, for uh, the human driver in terms of driving performance. Um, <clears throat> so how, how does it look like? Um, I have some, some, some images here. Um, in this case, you can see a dual plane head of display, uh, meaning that there are two planes. Uh, in this case, the furthest plane um, which is presented at a further distance than the near plane is augmenting uh, some information around uh, uh, 
perhaps navigation, whereas the closed plane uh, projects information that isn't directly related to the environment, such as speed. Uh, speed is something you do need in the environment, but it doesn't really have a relation with any object in the environment. Therefore, it is unregistered information, and we do have to wonder if that should be projected into the line of sight, into where you need to look at when you're driving. So when you see uh, this sort of image, then, then you realize that this uh, near plane is much more located at the bottom, uh, but still you're able to keep your eyes more or quicker on the road and uh, drive safer. Um, we also had our own uh, media article uh, a couple of years ago, which was around an auto stereoscopic concept. Uh, that can enable uh, a much more immersive 3D uh, experience. Um, and yeah, we're, we're continuously developing further and further, uh, not as JLR only, but uh, globally. Um, you see these um, ideas come up more and more, uh, all these concepts, but we do have to understand um, how they should work for the human driver. So. Um, I have a video here that was uh, put on YouTube in 2014 by, by Jaguar, and this is around uh, some augmented reality features where you can, in, in this case, it's a, a track example, uh, and in this case, it's a, it's a car of your previous lap of how you performed, and, and these are um, examples of how you can use augmented reality to, um, to add to the environment, to add to the experience, uh, while still hopefully being um, or enabling this, this safer driving experience, but also a pleasurable one. Pleasurable one. Um, and it's, it's a very immersive experience. But why exactly um, do we need to use augmented reality? Can't we just use that 2D image and, and make it bigger? Um, I don't believe so, because that's not really how we as humans uh, really work. Um, and as illustration in the image on the left, we see um, a car and you see a small blue box. And that's kind of what the head of display image uh, represents today. If we look at the right image, we see that that box is, I wouldn't say very big uh, because it can't really cover uh, what we want to show. Because in a situation like this, where there is low visibility, uh, we might not be able to see the pedestrian uh, in this low visibility, low visibility scenario. We might not even be able to see uh, the lanes. But if we could augment them, if we could augment the, the pedestrian crossing the road, then we could actually provide this much safer uh, a driving experience, we're able to show things that you normally could not really detect. Uh, but in order to do that, we need to have a very big field of view. Uh, we also need depth. And depth is one of the biggest enablers of augmented reality. Uh, we use depth in our daily lives. So why not use depth in, in uh, our head of display systems? So this is where we arrive at the head of display and the human factor. Uh, because the goal, the main goal of the head of display is to provide a safer vehicle guidance and information uptake by minimizing the need to shift attention and accommodation from the road. Um, and over the years, uh, we see in literature, various tests and experiments have shown that there are definitely a number of benefits of using a head of display. So as said before, uh, it's a decreased eyes of road time, especially when you compare it to the information in, in the cluster, in the instrument uh, panel right in front of you, uh, but also the one, um, the, the center screen. Uh, in the middle, as we see, we saw from that picture from the Volkswagen Golf in, in 2005. If you show navigation information there and you look there while driving, then you have to look up again. You have to reinterpret the scene and understand where you're going. And, and that's a cognitive process that we can eliminate by using a head of display. So there's reduced recognition and accommodation time. And there's also faster uh, task execution time. 
and that all leads to improved vehicle behavior. We've seen in uh, our own experiments in literature that when people are driving with a head of display, the vehicle behavior is much calmer, much smoother. Um, steering wheel deviations, for example, are much more consistent. Uh, braking acceleration is also more consistent. There's better consistency in maintaining the vehicle speed. So overall, the vehicle is just behaving calmer. And therefore, uh, that is a, a less stress for the driver, less things to worry about while driving, while executing that, that driving task. Um, but already in the early 90s, uh, we see that, that researchers really start uh, uh, in the field of human sciences to investigate if that head of display um, is actually safe, because we can put whatever content we want on that display, but it does need to be safe, it doesn't need to be destructive for example. So already at an early stage, various uh, challenges have been identified that affect the safety. And some of them still, still exist today. Um, and, and that just highlights how complex the issue is. Uh, in terms of um, head of display size, the field of view, we know that the field of view is very small at the moment. And in order to have augmented reality, it needs to be very big. It needs to go in depth. Uh, it needs to highlight things at a certain distance, uh, close and far. Um, we don't know much about what actual shape we need of the head of display. Uh, currently, it's just a square. Um, but is there a different shape that we need? Maybe something uh, there is, could be more efficient for us as drivers. Uh, we need to think about the placement of the information um, but also what the information is. Is it just an icon that you want to show on the head of display? Or do you really want to show that natural augmented information? Because that's essentially more intuitive. Uh, we also have uh, interference from the background scene complexity. So we're driving in various different environments on the various different conditions, uh, city versus uh, more natural looking uh, environments. Um, daytime versus nighttime, heavy traffic versus almost no traffic. Um, system novelty is related to how well are you experienced with the system? I mean, how many of you have actually driven with a head of display? So in order to have a very quick adaptation, uh, a very easy learning curve, we do need to uh, design our content in a way that is very intuitive and safe and, and not uh, masking anything in the environment because we do need to monitor the driving uh, the environment uh, while we're driving as well. We can't be distracted by that content. Um, and, and that also brings us to the user perceptual style. There are so many individual differences between you and me. Uh, there are people who wear glasses, uh, there are people who not wear glasses, but potentially would need glasses. There are definitely cognitive differences uh, between people with, with visual um, uh, deficits, for example. Uh, when you become older, the eyes or the performance is also uh, decreasing. And yeah, that, that brings up a, a very wide range of people who could potentially use a head of display, but for those people that, that display um, also needs to work. And in terms of cognitive disruption and, and perceptual tunneling, um, the content that we show them, it needs to work, uh, as I said before already, it needs to work well, it needs to be intuitive, perceived quickly. We need to understand how quickly we can uh, execute the task. Um, and it doesn't need to be distracting because if it is, then we have something called perceptual tunneling. The content is actually distracting us from the environment, the driving environment. And that's something that we do need to avoid, of course. Um, going a little bit more in detail on the human factor, uh, kind of on the experimental or the psychology uh, uh, field, is uh, where we can extract that field into different aspects. And they all have something to do with uh, designing for a head of display. We need to think on all these levels 
in order to understand, in order to align the technology that we're developing uh, so that it works intuitively for, for the human. Um, so on the physiology side, we have, um, of course, uh, the lens, the retina, uh, we have rods and cones on our retina uh, and chromatic channels. And, and for each of these uh, items, I, I will give you an example of, of how that works in relation to a head-up display. Um, in terms of perception, there is uh, spatial vision, object detection, there are depth cues. Uh, we think about color, motion, contrast, brightness, acuity. And there's the, the cognition part, uh, so where really the processing uh, happens. So that is also, uh, or that also contains mental workload. So how busy is your brain? Uh, how much capacity do you have? Um, information search and complexity is the cluttering uh, of, of the head of display content uh, distracting you? Is it not helping you to execute that task properly? Is it taking up too much capacity? Uh, situation awareness that when you have looked at the content with, where you have understood what to do, when you look back into the driving environment, do you still understand where you are uh, and what you need to do? Um, and scene complexity also uh, belongs to that. And then there's the behavior part where um, there's response, um, there's distrust, acceptance, but it's also around mood. Um, and, and that can be moderated by the context as well. So by the amount of content that you show, where you place it, uh, what the environment looks like, but also culture. Different cultures have different driving standards, different, different driving behavior, but maybe your way of interpreting information uh, is also a difference. So these are all factors that you can take into account when you design a head of display system for the human factor. Um, as I said before, depth is one of the most important enablers of augmented reality. Uh, when we perceive depth, when we have processed, uh, then um, we use several depth cues uh, to understand uh, what depth is. And we have certain regions uh, where we look at. Uh, so there is a personal space. And in that personal space, we need a lot of accuracy because it's really close to us. And, and this is where a lot of things, uh, things can happen. Um, we use cues uh, in the personal space, uh, for example, accommodation and convergence, which are the physical uh, uh, muscles for, for the lens that we use. Um, and something like motion perspective is also uh, something that we use within the personal space. But within the driving space, uh, we're also entering the action space. So um, things like height in the visual fields, but also binocular disparity, just using your two eyes to see depth, um, is, is uh, one of the cues that we need um, to, to maneuver in an environment. Uh, but there are also very consistent depth cues, uh, occlusion, placing items in, in front of the other gives us immediate information about what's nearer and what's closer. Relative size is when uh, something is close, it's bigger than that it's further away. And we can use all of these cues, and we should try to use all of these cues uh, when we design <clears throat> a system for, for the user. Um, and you can, you can obviously understand that from, from the image on the left, um, that we can use perspective to show some depth. Um, relative size is also very important there. So yeah, it's very important to align ourselves to how we work as humans, how we process things. Um, going a bit more or a bit further into, into one of these cues, per, uh, perspective, is that we have to be careful uh, about misperception. Um, if you look at this image, you and, and it's kind of an art installation from an artist called Jan Dibbets. Um, but what you can see is an installation that kind of represents a perspective, but it's not entirely correct. And even though there aren't really a lot of perspective um, 
other perspective cues around, um, you still notice that there is something, there's something wrong, there's something misaligned, and this causes confusion. So if we show something on the head of display and it's not co showing correctly, uh, a lane that we want to highlight is not showing correctly, it's not mapped to the road, it could cause some noise and that noise could lead to uh, confusion and, and that's really what we want to want to avoid. So here even in, in, in this absence of, of the normal perspective, uh, we know from experience as well that this situation isn't entirely correct. And that's another factor that we have um, when we perceive things, we have experience in these things. So even though in the absence of other, those other cues, we know it's, it's not correct. Uh, when we use colors, it's also an interesting um, thing that, that is happening. And, and I wanted to give you an example here uh, because it's not always straightforward to use colors. Uh, if you try to read what's on, on the screen, then it feels kind of uh, unpleasurable. Um, it, it, it doesn't really feel nice, and, and especially also when, when the letters are smaller. Uh, or even if you reverse the colors. Uh, and I'm going to explain you why this happens. Uh, and while I do that, I'll also take you to, through um, kind of the, the, the physiology uh, section uh, of the eye. So when we use colors, when we use letters, when, when all sorts of light enters the eye, <clears throat> and in this example, we use uh, the letter G, um, then it will go through the lens and it will be projected onto the fovea. The fovea is the central area of the retina. Um, it is where we uh, focus. So this is where we perceive all the detail. And um, that letter is then, because of the structure of the lens, uh, projected upside down on the fovea. Um, that retina, where, where the light falls onto and where the fovea was also part of, consists of, of rods and cones. And I'll go a little bit more in, de in detail on, on the next slide around these uh, uh, receptors, because that's what they're called, photoreceptors. But when that light enters um, on those photoreceptors, it's encoded. So it goes from number two to number three to number four on the optical nerve uh, and, and uh, will go to the brain, but it's already pre-coded a bit uh, in order to have a faster uh, processing in the brain. And these rods and cones, they're actually quite important. They aim to strike a balance between maximizing resolution while maintaining sensitivity. Um, so rods, they are very well represented on the retina. Um, the pigments are very sensitive at low light levels. There are around 120 million of them. They're also mostly sensitive to, to light wavelengths, um, but they really help us to notice movement. Uh, and, and, and that's what they're really good at. They're really sensitive to movement. The cones are here for color. So they are mostly um, in the fovea. There are very little cones uh, outside of the fovea, the central area. Um, and there are three types, red, green, and blue. They're also 30 to 100 times less sensitive, and they function at high light levels. Uh, they're also maximally sensitive in the region of around 555 nanometers. Um, in terms of the width of these photoreceptors, because we do have a, a limited area on the retina where, where these can be placed, and the width impacts the spacing, and the spacing determines the ability to resolve detail. So the rods um, that are mostly um, located outside the fovea have a, a light sensitive portion with a diameter of around one micrometer uh, near the fovea. So that gives you an indication of the size of these, of these uh, photoreceptors. Whereas on the cone side, uh, the fovea, so on, around one and a half millimeters wide, containing around 500 photoreceptors. Um, and it's a light sensitive portion, uh, which has a diameter of around one to four micrometers in the fovea and four to 10 outside of the fovea. So much bigger outside. Um, 
and in terms of length, the, the rods are uh, shorter or equal size uh, compared to the cones. The cones in the fovea are a bit longer. Um, they're twice as long, actually, uh, and they absorb to, to 50% of, of incident lights in the fovea. And the rods around 42% of, uh, of incident light. So when we look at the visual process, the light enters the lens and is projected onto uh, the retina. And, and in the section of the eye physiology, you see on, on the second picture what, what the retina looks like. Uh, you see some, um, uh, which are some veins uh, and the optic nerve and, and the fovea. Um, in terms of stages of perception, we see that from one eye, the 180 degrees of light and color, it comes from the outside. It's formed as a luminance map um, that then becomes an inverted image um, in, in um, uh, picture or, or illustration number number six. And the kind of darker areas around it is because they have combined the two eyes and, and that's kind of the general view that you see. So when the rods and cones respond to lights, uh, then we go up again in, on the eye physiology section, but then uh, picture number three, you can see clearly that the cone density distribution is really in and slightly around the fovea and the rod density distribution is outside of that. Uh, if we look at the image underneath that, then we can see that the, the cone cells really see that, that detail uh, and color as well, because outside of that, you don't really see a lot of that. Uh, in terms of the rod cells, there's a lot of value. There are boundaries, there are ranges that, that you see. Um, and then that's what we also use when we, uh, when we look in the dark. We mostly use our, our rod cells. And then the, uh, the images are combined, the information is processed, the image is re-inverted, and, and then we see something as in uh, picture number nine, uh, as, yeah, as we see in our daily lives. And uh, this is kind of an, an interesting illustration of, of the uh, visual process. Um, when we're going back to, to the example I showed with the, uh, the contrasting colors, um, it's an interesting effect that's happening, but in short, the chromatic channels, which encode color and, and luminance for us, there are three types. There's the red green, there's the blue yellow, and there's the light and dark. But in case, uh, in the case where we are trying to read green letters on a red background or red letters on a green background, that confusion that that um, inconvenience that we feel is because the red and green on that chromatic channel turns on and off at the same time. It's causing a disturbance. Um, one other interesting, what I also wanted to highlight uh, on the graph on the left is that we see a kind of the normalized absorbance. We see the wavelengths where the colors are absorbed most efficiently. Uh, and when we think about where the cones were most sensitive around the 555 uh, nanometers, it's, yeah, it's almost a, a green color uh, where it is most sensitive. And maybe you've seen that before in, in aviation or in computer games, they always use that, that green color um, to, to uh, project on, on a head of display. Uh, apologies, I forgot to put that picture in, but but it's a very distinct color, uh, and I might be able to add it uh, to the presentation after this. Um, so so that's one of the effects uh, as well that is going on, and that we do need to design for, that we do need to take into account. Um, <clears throat> colors in the environment can also uh, blend into the environment, for example. There are situations, uh, for example, the picture on the left where we can show uh, a color like yellow uh, or something something else that doesn't really blend into the environment. Um, but then on the right picture on the right, we can also see that, that if we use that color, it might blend into the in environment. And, and this is just a very abstract um, example, but you can understand that if we use augmented reality, um, if we use different colors, 
then some of them might blend into the environment and some don't. So we do really need to have a, a very good understanding of how colors work in those sort of environments when they are uh, uh, kind of virtually presented because we can't just use simple uh, or colors that we use these days on, on the displays that we, that we normally use. Um, and the same accounts for, for uh, the color blue. Um, so that's yeah, that, that that's something that that still requires a lot of research, a lot of investigation. Um, when we look at the behavioral elements, um, I think there's an interesting example here as well. Is that in order to find solutions for um, for head-up display, for augmented reality, for designing features, we also need to look at human-human uh, interaction or human-environment interaction. And an example like this is where um, I've taken a, a, an image from the Inuit from the uh, Arctic. Um, the Arctic, very white environment, uh, a lot of snow uh, mostly, and um, how do you navigate through there? Because there are not that many cues that you can hold on to to, to navigate. Um, and what they use are landmarks, a picture on the right. Um, so you can use landmark as kind of a strategic navigation goal. And uh, when they go fishing, when they go on a boat, in order to navigate through the coastline, they have carved out the coastline inward and they kind of use a, a 3D, very effective 3D uh, uh, navigational device. And yeah, those are ideas or those are behaviors that we can learn from uh, and that we can possibly um, try to in, uh, implement or an element of that uh, into our features just by looking at how humans uh, behave between each other, but also how they interact with the environment. And in a picture like this, you can you can easily put a landmark um, um, in the distance. Uh, it's, it's very simple to navigate to, for example, but in a situation like this, it's much more difficult. There's so much more information that we have to process. Um, and even when you make it stand out of the environment, we still need to monitor that environment to, to navigate through very safely. So, um, yeah, we need to use various aspects, and by observing this this behavior, uh, we can definitely and definitely learn how to make it more intuitive. In this case, you see a little child following her father. She uses different cues, but also um, the footsteps in the sand and and the recognition of her father and. When you apply that into an automotive context, for example, you can potentially use a, a ghost car to navigate, to help you navigate through the environment. Um, but it doesn't always work. So you do have to be really careful with, with what you implement. Um, in a case of a roundabout, for example, we do need to monitor the environment when we're driving over the roundabout. So we might have to think of different solutions uh, for, for certain uh, situations in, in uh, a driving scenario. And um, yeah, that, that is kind of the end of my presentation. Um, I do have some conclusions. So I think driver information really transitioned from an analog information provision to digital information. And it's really entering an era of virtual information that yeah, really has to prove itself on, on several areas with many, many challenges. And especially augmented reality, um, the content has to be designed really well around the user's needs and capabilities. But it also means that the system needs to be able to provide uh, with those uh, needs and capabilities. And then it could really uh, be added as a benefit to the driving task. It could be a lot safer, a lot more intuitive. And, and a lot more pleasurable to use. Um, but it also makes you think that we do tend to, as humans, uh, as we've seen uh, as from a history perspective, we do tend to do to, to incremental steps. But is a head-up display, for example, really the type of uh, technology 
that that will carry us you know 20 50 years uh, uh, into the future for driving or could there be another more promising technology does the optical industry need to align to the automotive industry more or should it be opposite that's the question and and where does it end so thank you very much um, i hope you enjoyed the presentation and um, i'm looking forward to some questions if you have them thank you very, very much valerie it's a wonderful talk and uh, it has a comprehensive coverage of a wide range of things which you also not only just different topics of the human perceptions, but also across the history of the development. And I like it very much is it a focus on humans, is human centric and remind us we are doing research and develop the knowledge after all is for human beings. Yes. So I'll leave the floor open and any questions Valerian, I have a question, actually it was the question you asked at the very end. What do you think is uh, that as this things are developing, should we have for the, our technology machine towards a human or we have uh, other ways of the human to cope with the technology? Yes, uh, I, I did try to think of, of an answer for this, but it's just so hard to think of. Um, as humans, we have certain behaviors. We are always curious. We always want to investigate. And therefore, what we work on, we always want to progress um, until someone else comes with a different idea. And that's just a process that always happens. So to, yeah, to find an answer in that, it's... It's really about time. Time will tell. I'm, I'm not really sure what will happen. I, I think at some point we will have with, with added, added uh, artificial intelligence, we will see answers that we didn't come up with before. Um, but yeah, the, I, th I think that will take a while. Um, but on the short term, we, we still have uh, a lot of fundamental issues to solve, uh, which we can solve. Um, but it's it's also all about evidence, I think. Yeah, that's true. Anybody has any questions? Uh, hi, Mary. Hello. Yeah, uh, this is Rambo. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have uh, one question. Um, so I have saw many uh, interface, uh, AI 3D interface, and some are using uh, like the lane mar marking. Uh, for example, like the Benz S class, they use the uh, one red line to mark in the road. Uh, but today, I think you speak uh, another way is to uh, show a virtual car. So you follow the car. Um, I, I think these two are quite different uh, concept or quite different design because one is to try to uh, recreate or to follow the real world uh, as uh, accurately as possible. But as you mentioned, if it doesn't uh, do it very accurately, it may cause uh, like uh, interference or misconception to the driver. So um, do you think maybe like uh, a virtual car will be a better way or do you think what will be the, the, the good way to actually um, achieve a good AR effect? I, I think it's a, a combination of uh, several one, uh, several ones of, of them, because the car will work for some people, the car will not work for other people. The same uh, accounts for the lines, uh, the same accounts for arrows, when they, whether they, they stand up or are projected onto the road. There's always someone with different preference and I think the key is in providing uh, these different preferences so that they can choose um, and I think that will give the best results no no human is the same so no human will want the exact same solution it has to be tailored 
to those needs. And I, I also think that that based on the kind of cognitive state, the mental workloads, uh, this could potentially be altered towards that if, if that would ever be possible. Because then you can then you can really understand when something is appropriate to show and, and when it isn't. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think that's a very good uh, way. Uh, as I mentioned, it's like we can provide maybe like several modes for people to choose um, according to his preference. Thank you very much. And, and, and bear in mind, there are people who really do not like the head of display. So there will always be functionality to turn it off. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And other questions? Very much for everybody. Stay online. And then from the long lecture, which I think is uh, it itself is evidence that it's a very interesting lecture. Thank you very much, Eric. And thank you very much. Now, the lecture is closed. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending. See you next time. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you. Okay.